So uh, again, uh, thank you for a really generous uh, introduction, and and thanks just for letting me sort of pop into your class. Uh, this is this is an uh, uncommon opportunity for me, so I appreciate it. Um, so I'll I'll try and be sort of brief so that we can have more conversation and uh, get at I guess what what interests you about anthropology, how to approach anthropology, how to think about it. And uh, so I'll, I'll just sort of give a, a quick sketch of uh, my disposition toward uh, anthropology and doing anthropology and then uh, and then turn it over. So I guess the the main question that I have as I think about what it is to do anthropology and how to conceptualize it as a project and how to think conceptually about anthropology is um, how responsive are my concepts to the field? So that if I have concepts that, uh, that are not responsive to the field, then there's a real temptation to uh, sort of to do abuse to the field in which I'm studying by trying to bend it to sort of a ready-made set of concepts rather than bending my concepts to what I find in the field. So, um, okay, so that, that's an unforgivably vague thing to say. So let me try and sort of pin it down a little bit better. Um, it strikes me that anthropology has been very uh, conceptually and methodologically promiscuous over its history, which is something that, that I find is... Uh, a source of hope. It's kind of promising. Um, but anthropologists at the same time have also been prone to sort of being uh, held captive by certain uh, ways of thinking about how to uh, how to make sense of the field. And so We've had schools of functionalism, structuralism, to some extent political economy, uh, to some extent postmodernism, especially currently with the ongoing influence of uh, Foucault's work that, that have sort of had this dominant impact on the field at different moments. So the way that uh, I guess you could say I've been schooled in doing anthropology. I, I don't think actually has a name in the way that functionalism or structuralism and so forth have had. Uh, but you might cast it as something like uh, an anthropology of the everyday. And so that's sort of where I, I pin my hopes is on the, the idea of an anthropology of the everyday, which isn't uh, to my mind, sort of programmatic in the way that some of the other schools would be. So it's not uh, approaching the field in the sense of trying to uh, distill a particular practice that one encounters in the field and then work out what is the function of this. So not teleological in that way. It doesn't approach the field uh, to ask so what are the dominant relations of difference and opposition that constitute the cultural within a given field, the way you would find in structuralism? Or what are the technologies of the self that pervade a particular community, the way that you would find with uh, the more Foucauldian-inspired um, models of, of anthropology? At the same time, though, I would say that there are, uh, I, I guess you could say, sort of a family of concepts that, uh, I, again, I think are not programmatic in that way, but uh, kind of help me as an anthropologist try to remain attuned to what I'm running into in the field. So the dominant of these would probably be something uh, like form of life. So form of life or forms of life. Uh, derives primarily from the work uh, of the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, 
uh, and then uh, got further elaboration from the American and uh, American philosopher Stanley Cavell, but got on my radar through uh, my thesis, my dissertation advisor, rather, uh, Vina Das, who has done uh, extensive work. Um, you're, you're probably already aware of that. So then what this tries to get me to look at is not just uh, sort of the, the cultural forms that pervade a, a specific community, but what are the notions of life? And this sort of drives me as an anthropologist. I, I think it would also arguably drive uh, Vina Das as an anthropologist to understand what are the sorts of agreements and criteria within a given community and how do those agreements allow things like agreement and disagreement in opinions so that there are these different levels of agreement. What this allows me to think about then is not how there are hard differences between me, the anthropologist, and uh, whoever I might wish to study with uh, in, on the model that used to dominate in anthropology where you had cultures in the plural, that is these sort of discrete entities that you could identify, you could draw borders around and uh, clearly distinguish from one another. So a way to get at what I mean by that is that when I was doing research in Thailand, uh, I was doing it, uh, of course, predominantly with Thai people who were Buddhist because Buddhism is the main uh, religion enjoyed by uh, Thai people. And on many things, you could say we shared a form of life. Why? Because we shared criteria for what constituted particular things. So let's say the human being. We shared criteria around um, not simply what it meant to be human, but what a human being was. But we would run into limits to what those shared criteria were. So uh, around ideas of something like a soul, there's a particular set of pictures of what a soul is within Buddhism, not one singular picture, but sort of a shared range. And the possibilities for uh, generating karma and experiencing reincarnation were limits beyond which I could not go with them. So as a, a way of sharing a form of life, we could go up to that limit. I could understand what lay on the other side of that limit intellectually. But in a sense, there was, that was somewhere I couldn't go with those people at that time. Now, to ward off any sense that this has this kind of exoticizing, aren't they, uh, aren't they strange and unique over there, unlike us? Well, this is the same kind of thing that I share with family members of mine. So uh, several of my family members are committed Christians, and so they have a particular idea of what a human being is in relationship, say, to God. And again, that is not a picture of the human that I share. There are criteria that we do not share so that while we could perhaps have a meaningful conversation about whether or not there is such a thing as a God, we can't have a meaningful conversation in the same way about, say, the nature of God. Why? Because the criteria that we apply to that notion are fundamentally different. For me, those criteria lie in the range of something like fiction. For them, they lie in the direction of something like reality. And so again, we run into limits so that these are not uh, the hard limits of something like culture, but are sort of the limits of what it is to share criteria. Now, what does that mean for doing anthropology? Well, to my mind, what it means is that we try to make, as an anthropolog as anthropologist, sorry, we try to make sense of what 
the relevant criteria are with respect to the people who we want to understand, who we want to study with. And, uh, and that is largely constant, constituted through an attention to the everyday. One of the dominant ways that someone like Vina Das would approach this is to, to get at that through, well, what are the threats to the everyday? And uh, these can take the form of skepticism, where, um, as, as she would put it, if I lose my sense that my children love me, that doesn't just throw those relationships into peril, it throws for her her world into peril, that the world in a sense becomes unrecognizable to her. She loses her sense of what the everyday is. So by, by attending to what these notions of threat to the everyday are, then we can also get a sense of what the criteria are that constitute everyday life and uh, and as I say, to come to sort of try and close the loop that I started with, what I think this pushes us to do as anthropologists is to remain responsive to everyday life as we encounter it in the field, rather than trying to come with, as it were, a, a ready-made set of concepts that we try and fit the field into. Uh, so perhaps I've, I've sort of meandered around the topic enough now to, to pause and uh, have a conversation about this, or should I say uh, just a little bit more? Um, I think it would be great if you could talk a little bit more about your fieldwork in Thailand. Sure. Well, actually, I, I want to start off somewhere else. Um, I want to start off where what I'm doing right now with, uh, with my students in my class um, is... Uh, hopefully helpful in opening up what I'm talking about when I talk about the everyday. So uh, I had been, as uh, Professor Ibrahim pointed out, uh, doing a project on atheism in America. And, uh, and of course, then the pandemic uh, interrupted that so that doing field work was, was simply off the table. So, so that is a project that I'm doing in principle, but I'm not doing it in fact right now. And so instead, what I've been working on with my students has been uh, a project uh, organized around people's experiences of COVID, uh, but specifically looking at what the pandemic has done to people's sense of the everyday. And this has kind of come in, in two phases. So uh, on, the, on the first count, what we've been looking at is how disruptive the pandemic has been to people, not just in terms of their daily habits and their daily routines, but their sense of whether they can have relations that are sensible to them with other humans. So that uh, one of the things that I think has thrown people's sense of everyday life into turmoil is that for the better part of two years, we didn't know who was a threat to us. We didn't know who we were a threat to uh, in terms of our, our health. We didn't know what measures were appropriate to take in order not to be a potentially lethal threat to one another. And... So we, we didn't actually know how to relate to one another. And uh, in, in, in many parts of the world, certainly in the US, um, that became something that it was almost uh, impossible on some occasions even to have a conversation about. And so in, in one sense then, this is a, a picture of how everyday life gets um, is vulnerable to uh, th this kind of just massive disorientation. But then also the companion part to that is uh, what sorts of measures have people, or what sorts of projects have people engaged in to try and recover a sense of everyday life. So that this is not a matter of going back to 
an, an everyday that existed previously, because in a sense that's off the table now, but rather has been a project of trying to figure out who we are to one another and building a life around that. Um, so, so that's what I'm working on now. So then very brief, briefly then, my work on uh, Thailand had to do with human rights. So the thing that interested me there was uh, how human rights at the moment that I had started my field work in the early 2000s was a, a really unsettled set of ideas in and practices and institutions in Thailand. And so I wanted to get a sense of what the nature of this emerging set of concepts, practices, uh, institutions, and dispositions was. Uh, because it didn't strike me as something that you could capture with just the importation of a set of internationally available ideas supplanted into this place. And, uh, and, and indeed, it, that's not how it looked in the field as well when I got there. So that the way that the, the people who I was working with, who initially were people at the Commission of Human Rights, and then later uh, were human rights lawyers uh, who I went to southern Thailand with after the tsunami hit there in 2004. Uh, the, the, the way that they understood human rights was deeply imbued with ideas of, um, say, Buddhist ethics, for example. But not just any Buddhist ethics, not the prevalent Buddhist ethics, but a particular school of Buddhist ethics that was concerned with uh, a more egalitarian view of the human than you got in the dominant view of Buddhism in Thailand, which was much more organized around uh, karma and the inequalities between humans that corresponded with different um, sort of accretions of karma or of merit. And, uh, and so the, I'm trying to think of how much more detail to go into this. So I guess I'll, I'll just try and cap it with this. Then what was interesting to me was how uh, Thai people who were concerned with sort of anchoring human rights within Thailand and uh, disseminating human rights as practices, as concerns, and as ideas, uh, we're, we're really not in the business of trying to persuade people to adopt a set of ideas that came from somewhere else. They were really concerned with trying to get people to recognize how uh, human rights concepts and principles were already available in the traditions that organized their lives. And so the way that I would put it is how the criteria for human rights were already present in their criteria for what human beings were and therefore what proper ways of treating human beings were and how to go about doing that. So, okay, maybe I'll put a period at the end of that and, and see how that works. <laughs> Great, thank you. So, um, I'm going to ask our three questions. What, what, what's your name? I don't know. Um, I'll ask with your question. Do you want to do it one at a time? Like one question and then we'll open it up to one side. Yeah? Yeah. Let's do that. Thank you, first of all, for joining us. Very uh, interesting conversation so far. It's been great hearing about your research. We've talked a lot in this course so far about dominant narratives, um, how our imagination and perception of certain groups 
people or places might be informed by ideas in pop culture or the mainstream, and how sometimes there's an opportunity for ethnography and anthropologists to either contribute to or correct or shape these dominant narratives, which can uh, also just generally shape the way that history is understood and written. Um, and I was interested in the interplay with this and your idea of the anthropology of the everyday, which can sometimes be just a much more accurate picture of how people live their lives and interact with one another. So I was curious about this idea of dominant narratives, correcting them, whether you think there is a place in ethnography for this, or more particularly a burden. Do you think anthropologists um, are, have this responsibility to try and kind of correct um, misguided narratives about people, or do you think it's uh, more just the practice of going, observing, like you said, seeing what the field gives to you, and then kind of uh, getting the observation way, if that makes sense? Yeah, what a terrific question. Um, I think I, I have sort of two responses, and unfortunately, they don't line up with each other all that well. Uh, so the, my first response is, um, on the whole, anthropologists should do what they find meaningful. And, and so I'm very, very reluctant to be programmatic in terms of what I would if I were in such a position, what I would tell anthropologists that they should do. Um, having said that, though, I also think that anthropology is somewhat uniquely positioned to uh, respond to and um, maybe not necessarily correct, but add uh, nuance and depth and and perhaps to trouble dominant narratives, not necessarily dominant narratives, narratives of any sort uh, about any uh, any particular place that you would want to uh, consider, in including, of course, uh, the places where anthropologists usually live. So uh, the US, the UK, Canada, wh what have you. Um, because, of course, we can turn the anthropological lens wherever and uh, seek to have a deeper and more subtle uh, understanding of any place. So that um, where I would arrive with that then is less that I think that anthropologists ought to do this or that, but that anthropology provides opportunities and where there are anthropologists who are interested in latching on to those opportunities um, in, in my own work, for example, to push back against the idea that there is a sort of, that, that history tends towards this convergence of ideas and practices and that the attainment of human rights is in some way a step in the progress towards something that looks suspiciously like um, the uh, enlightened West, uh, that, that that's actually not such a robust kind of narrative after all. When, so that when we start to, to make sense of how it is that again, just in the case of my research, uh, Thai people are finding human rights to be already available in uh, a, a set of ethical practices and principles that are much older than, say, the Christianity of the West. Well, then it makes it much harder to maintain this idea that Thailand is somehow catching up with the rest of us or something so that it, it it can have the possibility of troubling these notions of convergence or of um, societies being ahead and behind one another uh, in on some sort of ladder of progress and so I I for myself I think that that's valuable work to do I think it's worth doing it 
uh, I, I simply wouldn't try to instruct other anthropologists in, in whether they ought to do it or not, whether they ought to have my set of interests and my set of concerns or not. No, they, they, they should do what motivates them. And, um, and, and uh, um, my suspicion, though, is that there will be plenty of people motivated to try and offer correctives all the same. So does that, I'm not sure, that I, I might have wandered off point there. Does that address your question? That does, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I was gonna actually follow up with how you might have experienced this in your own field work, so I appreciate the kind of um, demonstration of the Thailand and how you focus, so. Oh, you. great, okay, thank you. So I actually add something to that, which is that when we, <laughs> excuse me, when we teach, or when I teach, certainly I should say, uh, like in the intro to anthropology course here at Georgetown, um, we typically start off, and I'm sure all of the ones in this room who are anthropology majors and minors have had this experience, we talk about method and we talk about particular concepts that are sort of like the backbone of anthropology as we know it, right? Like modern anthropology comes out of uh, the concepts of participant observation, um, here's Malinowski, here's Boaz, um, the ideas of descriptions, particularly six description like Gears gave us. And so what I found really interesting in your description of how you think about anthropology and how you think of yourself as an anthropologist is that none of these typical quote unquote methodologies present there, right? So, and then you said just here to uh, Terence's question, you said, but you know, anthropology is positioned to question narratives wherever, you know, whatever kind of narratives they may be. And it, it's uh, positioned to question, to nuance them or to investigate them um, because of how it's positioned. So I want to sort of take these two ideas and where is the method or what do we identify as methods then when we aren't uh, when we're talking about criteria, when we're talking about limits, when we're talking about forms of life, what then, what do you think of as methods go along with this, or is that not even the kind of question that one should be asking? Uh, yeah, so, so I, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe this dates me in a way, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but, um, uh, it does still seem to me like participant observation is a, a definitive um, method in that, that distinguishes anthropology. And the, the way that I might um, tilt that a little bit to make it... Um, to, to orient it more around my concerns with the everyday and, and the ordinary and form of life and things like that is to say that um, one of the aspects that I find most um, potent and most enabling in participant observation is the idea that as an anthropologist, while you're engaged in doing ethnographic research, in a really important way, you are answerable to the field. And so this, this also comes back, I think, it dovetails with the idea of responsiveness that I was trying to get at around uh, concepts and, and methods. But um, like I'm hard pressed to come up with another discipline that uh, sort of on its billboard advertises the way that its practitioners make themselves answerable to the field. And th so this is, again, why I think that anthropology uh, is kind of uniquely placed and is capable of doing a sort of work that is not readily available within other disciplines. So that when you see it, arise in, say, sociology or political science, it's largely when political scientists or sociologists adopt anthropological methods to do their work. 
so that in in a sense to to use um, exactly the wrong word to talk about this uh, it, in a way it's not native to those disciplines in a way that it is to anthropology and uh, and so anyway th th this is why I guess I find that the possibilities that participant observation opens up are important are distinctive and uh, really allow the the academic the scholar to uh, remain in a sense uh, again responsive to what they find in the field so so just as a last note uh, Wittgenstein has this line about um, that kind of captures the idea of differences in criteria and differences in of form of life where he says that you can find yourself among people, even people with whom you share a language, but it, that you can't find your feet with them. And th it's a line that Geertz also uh, borrows from Wittgenstein, though, though he does it in a way that I think is um, uh, not, not the way that I would. But then the idea that participant observation is really organized around the idea of finding your feet with people, I think is a powerful idea. Again, because it positions the anthropologist as the one who has to remain answerable. It's not that the field is answerable to you, though of course there are anthropologists who try to do that. There are anthropologists who study Thailand who try to do that, and it makes me a little batty. But anyway, um, but that it, still this idea that it's the anthropologist who has to remain responsive, the anthropologist who has to do the work of finding his or her feet with the field. That, I think, is a powerful idea and, um, and, and a very, very important one. Um, I guess I was going to stay kind of staying with your uh, topic of like not bending the field to the anthropologist, but rather reverse of that. Um, you read one book that kind of relates to that was Exit Zero by Christine Wally, um, in which Wally like focused on deindustrialization in Southeast Chicago. And when she was doing her field work, she found that those she would interview always went to personal stories and storytelling. Um, uh, like when she would interview them, and that storytelling was their unit of analysis. Um, and so that kind of led her to write the book one part memoir and one part ethnography. So I, storytelling is something we talk a lot about in this class. And I was just wondering what place you think personal narratives uh, kind of have in creating rich ethnography. And with that, like what pitfalls autoethnography or even ethnographic fiction could avoid to still maintain like proper uh, anthropological standards, kind of like Narayan mentions of accountability and disclosure of the process, kind of how you work with those two. Ah, great. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, I think that one of the things that is, uh, to my mind, very encouraging within anthropology, not throughout the course of its entire history, but um, and not in the case of every anthropologist, but certainly since the, uh, the, the sort of the reflexive turn that um, anthropology went through in the 80s and the 90s, but also in, in some classic works, Malinowski um, in, would be one. Evans Pritchard, I think, would maybe be a better example, is how the anthropologist um, typically keeps him or herself within the frame of the study. So uh, if you were to think of something like, say, uh, psychology, where the psychologist is formally kept out of the frame of the analysis, at least as far as I have uh, read in this. Like that, that's a real methodological difference. And so the, the way then that the anthropologist will uh, approach giving an account of whatever, so giving an account of the emergence of human rights in Thailand 
is one that maintains the anthropologist within the set of social relations that are under study. Um, so that's one part of it. The, the second part of it, the part of it that, that generates much more apprehension for me is when the ethnographer starts to make the ethnography all about the ethnographer. And uh, so it's not that there can be no value to that. I personally, I find it gets tiresome and, uh, and, and very often it uses, uh, well, very often it uses the field as a pretext for the ethnographer to talk about him or herself as a pretext to talk about the, the struggles that the ethnographer went through during the course of the ethnography. And again, it's not that that has no value, um, but it does feel to me like there can be a really instrumental relationship to the field. And I think that that does a certain disservice to the field. Again, because as I say, the sort of guiding uh, principles for me have to do with responsiveness to the field and with answerability to the field, which, which is to say to the people that one encounters during research. And uh, that tendency seems to me to try and force the field to become responsive to the ethnographer and to the ethnographer's concerns and to the ethnographer's trials. Uh, so I, I think that's the, the big, so I think those are the two main tendencies that I see. One is a, a sort of a, a promise of ethnography. The other is a potential pitfall of ethnography. Um, now, I feel like I, I've lost track of uh, part of the question about storytelling. Is there something that I've neglected in that? Or was that part of the question? Well, I think you know it. Okay. I think one of the things that we have spent a lot of time uh, talking about uh, when it comes to storytelling is what storytelling itself is as a form of claim in anthropology. So uh, at the start of this class, there were some of us in the room that were curious to know what makes anthropology and ethnography specifically as a form of writing different, say, from journalism, right? And this is very often a comparison that comes up because new journalism particularly long form investigative journalism sometimes looks very much like uh, you know a well-written ethnography um, or a, an article that might derive from some other topic um, and so how would you suggest and think about those two in relation to the idea of storytelling uh, that that is that is a challenging question um, uh, so, I think, uh, on the whole, I would have to defer to you on uh, things having to do with journalism, and in part with storytelling, because you, you just have more, um, you've, you've studied it, you've uh, been much more attentive, for example, to Walter Benjamin's work on um, like the task of the storyteller. Uh, so, so in large part, I, I frame my response as uh, deferential to you on this because I, I think you've actually got the chops on this where, where I don't. Um, but the so the one thing that I would um, have to say about storytelling is that storytelling is first of all I think it's just by this point sort of encoded into our DNA that storytelling is one of the ways that we make sense of what we see around us. It's the way that we uh, generate and anchor social relations with one another. Um, for better and for worse, it's it can be ways a way of how we determine who are ours and who are not ours, uh, often with um, disastrous 
results. Um, so, so storytelling is not all rainbows and puppies. Um, but that in relation to anthropology, I, I would say that uh, storytelling is one of our major sources f as anthropologists for, uh, as I put it before, how we find our feet with people who um, may on some level be uh, hard for us to understand. Um, and, uh, and for getting a bead on how the people we're interested in make sense of their worlds. So that when my students go out and uh, interview people about their experiences with COVID, um, what, they're, what they're soliciting people from people are their stories. And so in, in that way, I think in, indeed, storytelling is uh, the, one of our major sources of information, um, expression, and uh, l let's say data uh, from the people who, with whom we want to find our feet. The other side of it, of course, is that as writers, part of what we're doing then is recounting stories. And I think that this is a tricky relationship because in part, we position ourselves as the storytellers. Uh, and yet, to a large extent, the stories that we're telling are not our own. And so there's, uh, to, to go back to one of the pieces I think you had to read for this week uh, by Samina Mola, there's uh, a notion again of maintaining responsibility or as I was putting it, answerability to the field so that when you're recounting stories that are not your own, there's, there's a sense of responsibility that I think goes along with how you recount it and with exactly what you recount. Not all stories that were given are ours to share. And so, um, so now how, how that distinguishes ethnography from long form journalism, uh, I, I don't really feel well equipped to, to speak to that. As I said, I think, I think you've thought much more um, systematically about that than I have. So I'm, I'm gonna dodge the question. <laughs> So this kind of relates to what we've been talking about. Um, at the beginning of the semester, we read Clifford Geertz. Um, the classified his reading as narrative-based and descriptive and immersive. Um, and, you know, you kind of talked about um, how seeking criteria as an anthropologist, you know, causes you to remain responsive and engaged with the field um, instead of relying on ready-made concepts that you were talking about. Um, uh, looking at the notions of life drives anthropologists to understand the criteria within a given community. Um, and yet you sort of talked about how you give the example of you're t discussing Christianity with your family and how you can have a conversation about if there's a God, but not the nature of God because of the difference in the limits, is limits that are caused um, by your different views and criteria. So I guess my question is kind of how is ethnography immersive um, and how do you allow, as an ethnographer and anthropologist, um, writing anthropology to allow other anthropologists studying your work to kind of be immersed in you know, your storytelling and um, the culture that you are um, discussing? Okay, this so so there are no easy questions today. I see. All right. Um, yeah. So the. There's a fair bit about Geertz that annoys me, but one of the things that I appreciate about his work is that he's he's pretty crafty at drawing you into uh, a setting, and um, 
so so I'm latching onto this idea of immersiveness that that you were uh, that you're using because I, I think that that's a really apt word for what I think he tries to do. So I think Geertz tries to sort of draw you in um, uh, narratively so that your attention is completely absorbed by the scenario that he's describing. So, I mean, the Balinese cockfight would be uh, a, a prime example of that, I think. Um, and so as an aspiration, it seems to me like that that's a pretty fine aspiration for an anthropologist to have. To, because if you are, as a writer, successful at drawing somebody, immersing somebody in a particular scenario in that way then uh, one of the possibilities that you generate is that your reader will um, find that the distance that he or she may have initially anticipated experiencing with whatever scenario you're writing about uh, is not so great after all. And that... Um, the people who uh, are, are supposed to be exotic and strange and from somewhere else and, and concerned with other things, um, like just on the, on the cusp of not even being humanly recognizable, in fact, then become in a way uh, recognizable uh, because you're drawn in in this kind of immersive way. Now, I, again, I think with, with Geertz, there are real shortcomings. Um, I, I, I note, for example, that almost nobody in his writing has a first name so that you never get a sense of who people are, who you get, you get a sense of the sort of the picture of the Balinese cockfight, but not who any of the people participating it are in it are not, not with uh, what matters to them individually you only get this sort of sense of meaning as something that is very uh, broad and amorphously shared not not how meaning enters into an individual life for example so so I think that there are uh, barriers that that may just be unnecessary that he places between his reader and the individuals with whom he's interacted like I like maybe at the end of the day we wind up getting much closer to Geertz than we do to Balinese people engaged in in cockfighting. Having said that, I, I'm I'm not persuaded that that's inevitable in ethnography. So that um, to to just come back to Vina Das's work uh, because that that's a touchstone for me in a way that few other people's work can be. Um, Almost all of her work is really centered around singular individuals, singular people. And so rather than having the sort of broad, general, as I say, amorphous discussion of what the cockfight means for the Balinese, the Balinese, as, as if that's like a closed unit, in Das's work, what we get is how the individual lives a life within a particular setting, within a particular context of the specific forces acting on that individual and how they play out often in quite unexpected ways, uh, which is again is something that I appreciate in her work, that, that she's capable of conveying surprise at what happens in the field. And that I think is I don't know if it's immersive in the same way, but I feel when I read it, I feel captured by it in a way that the work of someone like Geertz doesn't do. Why? Because I start to, I, I discover as I'm reading, sometimes quite to my own surprise, that like now I feel a stake in this individual's life. I feel a stake in what happens with this or that person. I, I, I feel um, outrage at what one person has had to experience as a consequence of forces that are large in scale, say with collective violence, but that have um, 
immediate impacts for that individual within the confines of kinship relations, for example. And so that there's, there's a way then that that kind of work is, for me, more kind of uh, arresting. It, it sort of it brings me up short and it, and it engages me in a way that I find very compelling. And again, that I, that I find is um, outside of, uh, say, well-done fiction is not widely available in other disciplines as far as I'm aware. Uh, okay, so once again, I feel like maybe I wandered off the question. Did I, did I actually respond to the question or did I wind up giving you an answer about something else entirely? Well, okay, good, good, thanks. All right, how about we take a break for about uh, 15 minutes? Come back at quarter to two, then I will actually follow up on your question um, on immersiveness and this idea of connected to an idea that many of you have already raised in some of your essays. I know I have said a lot, but I feel so it's good to write a book like a marathon on India, which is trying to have a weather so that one can teach it and undergrad level. So I, I caught only about 30% of what you said right there. I, but I heard Cavell, so of course I'm, I'm now, I want you to repeat it all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have to say the um, the last two semesters are really the first times that I've uh, felt bold enough to to really try and study uh, to to teach Vina's work. Um, in any kind of extended way, like rather than just having like one essay here or one essay yeah. there, it's uh, I've finally come to the point where uh, I I feel like it's not only something that is important to do, but that I kind of have uh, a way of doing. Yeah, no, like the way you the way you set up. This form of life next to like functionalism and structuralism, like Marxism, like that immediately makes it so much clearer. And I've been reading her work for like a minute, right? So, yeah, it just it comes together much more anthropological, if that makes any sense, than even can't get it in a class with Dina because Dina has 20 different characters that she is pulling on and she just expects you to be running along with them. Right. And anything in the which of course none of us are, but you know. Um, but yeah, that, this, is, this goes back to my, we should write a textbook together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I guess, so first of all, thank you for that. Um, but I, I think also part of where this is coming from is um, having now started to think about how I position myself with respect to other people in my department and with respect to the field more broadly. And... Uh, so, so I know that, that I differ from people in my department, um, be, because there's, 
like n nobody there comes from a background that uh, that includes Vina's work, much less ordinary language philosophy uh, or anything like that. And, and actually, we're very few anthropologists in my department anyway. It's mostly sociologists. And, and so there's uh, an even greater remove. And so trying to work out <clears throat> how how I see myself within the department is is part of what I think has um, motivated me to try and, and figure out j just what it is that I would want to try and teach with respect to Vina's work and and now others like Michael Lambeck and, and people like that who sort of come uh, from the same, from a shared set of influences. I wouldn't call it a tradition, yeah. but, but from a shared set of influences. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so I think that's part of it. But then, yeah, I mean, actually, no, I don't really think of myself in terms of how I'm positioning myself in the field. I'm not sure if the field is all that aware that I exist. So, you know. <laughs> And it's yeah, but you know the theory that you have, one has to position oneself somehow back to that. But for me, it doesn't know a lot of people exist. Like indeed, indeed, it doesn't. <laughs> but yeah, certainly, yeah. So, so <laughs> thinking, thinking in terms of <clears throat> how I would approach the the performance and the teaching of anthropology given the particular kinds of traditions that have dominated in anthropology that's something i've had to think about and i think so i think that's where this is coming from now yeah i think that approaching it like that also has to break up that idea that here is school of this school of that school of the other <clears throat> And those rooms are also contained. They're not contained in intellectual or some sense. Right. But they are influences and people are reading across each other and they're reading each other. And I love how you said that anthropology has promiscuous methods and concepts. Yeah, that's great. I think it's a good thing. So it's true. I think we're out of time. It's definitely a little defensive about it. Actually, say, well, that actually is a hopeful thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to pick up on the last question. Um, so I'm trying to take some of the themes that have come up in discussion today and through your questions, uh, Terence, Mike, and Jemaya, uh, to try to tie them back to, and I'm going to explain this a little bit for uh, that one of their first or their first assignments was um, they had to write what was it like maybe two three pages right like about 500 600 words on what they think uh, anthropology is they and they had we had met only the first week and then we had a two week break because we were coming back the following week after a long weekend and that Tuesday was going to be a Monday class so we weren't going to meet for two weeks. And so I had given them, what, like eight or ten, I think, articles to read. I'm sure you all didn't read all of them. That's fine. <laughs> and based on those articles and whatever previous classes they had taken in anthropology, they had to write a sort of a short statement about what they thought anthropology and ethnography is. Um, and when they, I read them, I returned them, um, and then made some notes on some of the consistent themes that came up. And one of the themes that kept coming up in a lot of people's writing, and I think in most of the other classes as well, is the idea that anthropological writing, ethnography, participant observation, the methods, the approaches of anthropology help us to understand other people because primarily what they do is they humanize the form, right? They humanize people and context that we might otherwise be entirely unfamiliar with, they humanize them for us in a way that then brings them to life in some way. And so it becomes an aid in some way to understanding, right? It's feeling closer to. And then along with that comes a lot of things like empathy and 
what I liked about uh, Josiah's question and the way in which you addressed it is that you, you put this idea of immersion. Um, I think it also came off the previous question, which was about storytelling, right? So how do we write certain accounts, particularly accounts that are not ours to tell, right? But we're given a certain kind of permission, implicit or otherwise, by people in the field. We are constantly answerable to people in the field in one or another way, right? Uh, we're, we're crafting their stories into yet another story. Um, and so we are responsible for what and how we think out, but also we have to do it in a way that immerses people in the story that we are telling, right? And there are different ways to do this. You can do this, like as you said, you can work as an example. I agree with you, as a you can be a very fascinating writer, but at the same time, you don't expect more people to do it. Who's writing? Um, I mean, even in Evan Scripture's work, you get a sense of individuals do pop up in his work in a way that he feels, and because he's writing even later, they just never show up as individuals. Um, Zina's work, on the other hand, you really, across the course of her work, you've been allowed to be and sort of carry on with them as she goes back and meets them and revisits them and changes her way of being with them you get to sort of follow along in that work right so there, what I'm saying that here is not only is the how and how we recount and what we recount but also the, the fact that um, you write it in such a way that you can let, sort of reduce or lessen that distance the anticipation of a certain kind of distance between your reader and the people that they're reading about, right? That's sort of like the work of anthropology, the work of ethnography. I wondered what you might say if I asked you to put this in conversation with this idea of humanizing, right? Because there is, and there's two lines to this. One of them is that, um, is there a difference? Do you think that there is a difference? And if so, what is that difference? And then on the other hand, do you think there are any So, can you can you give me a little bit more of a sense of what you mean by the first part of what whether I think that there is a difference a difference sorry between what and what? Between this idea of humanizing mm. on the one hand and all of that all of the way in which we think about humanizing and why we need to humanize versus something like finding your feet with others finding criteria, sharing criteria. Um, is there a difference there? And if so, what is that difference? Okay, yeah, yeah, good. Um, So I, I, again, uh, in the spirit of being a broken record, I'll come back to Vina's work. Um, because I think one of the things that she gets across uh, with just spectacular uh, clarity is how um, the problem of, of humanization and dehumanization is not one that requires something like what we would have pre in a previous moment in anthropology called cultural difference. That um, when she writes about, say, the violence against uh, Sikh Indians in the wake of the assassination of Indira Gandhi in 1984, the problem is not that, um, say, Hindus and Sikhs are unrecognizable to one another as humans because they're culturally different. The problem is, um, how could the person who has been my neighbor kill my children in this way and be a human being? So that, again, it's not this thing of, of there being... Um, like some stark cultural difference that we have to overcome in order to approach the other, but rather that the people closest to one may throw into question your 
sense of what a human being is because that person engages in something that you think is not humanly possible. And so, so that uh, otherness is not in this way hedged in, in terms of distance, that the people closest to you can be the, the ones that are the greatest problem. And, and of course, she points to the way that Cavell writes about this in, in Shakespearean plays about you know how um, uh, Hamlet is populated by ghosts that have as much reality for him as the people around him and, and anyway I, I won't I won't go off into a Shakespearean tangent I'll spare you all that um, but but ho- so hopefully that that gets across the first part of the answer is that the the sense of difference in otherness um, in the way of doing anthropology that that I find most evocative is not built around ideas of distance, that uh, familiarity <clears throat> is no insulation whatsoever against the possibility of discovering somebody's inhumanness or inhumanity and uh, and having your your world thrown, your everyday life, as it were, thrown into <clears throat> question around that because uh, you find yourself uh, unable to rely on the criteria that seemed to apply up until this moment of breach. Um, so a, a second part to this that uh, I would want to highlight is... Uh, Stanley Cavell writes about um, what he calls my others. So he asks the question, who are my others? And the thing that I find so... Um, like he's not, he's not, to my mind, giving us a lot of clarity when he's asking that. He's asking something really provocative. And what it provokes for me is the sense that... Um, there's a way that my others specifically are not those who I find alien to me and incomprehensible to me. So that addition of my in front of others does a lot of work to help me think about how uh, otherness helps constitute me so that my subjectivity or my sense of self is not this standalone thing, but rather is constituted with my others. And, and, and I don't have the luxury of selecting who my others are going to be, that that is something I have to accept and respond to. Um, not, not something that, uh, again, as if I were a subject first and then chose who my others were to be constituted by them, that that's, that's not the picture that I'm getting from this. Uh, so then, what I think this leaves us with is that pictures of humanization and difference and otherness are uh, far more complicated than, than a, like a straightforward idea of a cultural other who we humanize through anthropological work. Would, would lead us to think. And so I come back to the example with my family members. So um, I, I, think, I think of my niece. Uh, I, I have a great deal of affection for my niece. Um, but, but again, I realize that there are uh, limits to the form of life that we share around uh, the question of God. And um, so that in that way, she is my other in that she, um, participates in constituting me as a subject in a particular way, but that our otherness is not built on distance. It's built on intimacy. And so, so that's, so that's the, the first thing that I, I sort of want to get off the table that the idea that otherness is about a rift that we need to breach 
or that we need to, to bridge, excuse me, uh, through our writing. That, that otherness can be something far more intimate than that. And that I think you, you can get that through ideas like form of life in the way that you can't with an idea like culture, because culture is much more divisive on that front. Um, so the the companion piece to then this then is that you're also asking about pitfalls of humanization and uh and so the danger there i think is of giving in to a notion that that i think is is kind of just a, a lazy notion that we can say oh we're all just basically the same at heart right and uh and and in that way the effort to humanize another who who may seem um, whose humanity may seem to be in question for whatever reason because of uh, unfamiliarity or whatever it might be um, that that can have the effect actually of erasing the particularity of others and uh, if you're again that I think comes back to this temptation not to be answerable, not to be responsive in the concepts that we employ when we are uh, engaged in the work of anthropology. So does that does that provide? I'm not sure if that's a satisfying answer or not. Yeah, I think all of that is really important, and um, I I agree that there's uh, there's a temptation that I think a lot of people fall subject to in the effort to humanize, as if 
if we just humanize others, we'll see that actually everybody's pretty nice. And, and uh, that seems to me obviously not to be the case. That, that actually the, the range of things that uh, humans are capable of doing include quite heinous things. And, um, and, and that we can't simply set that aside and say, no, that, that's not really what humans do. Uh, well, I mean, like we're, we're primates. Primates are, are pretty good at doing savage things to one another. And um, so it, it does seem to me like that, that in fact, if we want to talk about the human and humanization, uh, we can't just set those things aside and, and pretend that um, humanizing another is uh, first of all you're right it assumes that we know in advance what all the possibilities of of the human are and uh, that that seems to me not to be persuasive um, that there are things that can still surprise us in other words um, and I think that this is part of why uh, uh, writers like Roma Chatterjee and Deepak Mehta and, uh, and Vina Das, when they write about what it means to recover from uh, something like collective violence, the idea of recovery is not on the model of something like recovering from an illness where you're restored to health. It's something that has the shade of melancholy to it. Why? Because it means continuing to live with the monsters among you and recognizing that, first of all, that the monsters among you are actually humans, that they're going to be members of the community that you wish to restore. Because why? Because you're to follow uh, the line she takes from Wittgenstein you're re-inhabiting a scene of destruction. You're not departing a scene of destruction. You're re-inhabiting a scene of destruction. And that scene is, is uh, largely social in nature, though it can also be material. Um, so that the melancholy that you, that this forces upon you is the recognition of things like um, in order to have a life together, a future together, you may need to give up certain notions of justice. They may simply be unattainable. That you can have one or the other, but you can't have both a future together and justice. And that that imposes a certain kind of melancholy on everyday life. And this is part of the reason why the idea of recovering everyday life is um, not simply a celebratory moment, but that it's something that uh, can entail uh, huge costs and huge, huge sacrifices um, that in no way diminish the humanness of the other so that, again, my others may not be people who I much care for, but that, that doesn't remove them from the orbit of those who are my others, those who in, have a role in constituting my everyday life. Uh, okay, well, I'll take a pause there. I'm sure other people have things they want to say. Um, sort of going off of the conversation on like humanization, um, a lot of times. When I, like when I ask myself that same question, this sounds maybe a little bit cheesy, but I think of, I think it's like a Maya Angelou poem uh, when she says, "We are more alike, my friend, than we are unalike." And I'm not really sure how that ties into this conversation, but like um, when when we have thoughts like that, do you think that those thoughts can be? useful for dealing with other human beings? Like what, how can we even begin to define like alike versus unalike? Um, and let alone like 
uh, let alone gauging whether or not we are more alike than unalike or things like that. Um, I don't know. It's uh, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on that, but it is it is something that it's a framing that I usually I tend to think in um, in conversations. Yeah, so I, I think that there are a couple of really enabling things in that question. So so I'm going to um, try and, and get through them in some sort of coherent order. So the, the first is that uh, the idea of likeness is already, to my mind, drawing on the, tr the, the sort of uh, philosophical influences that I've been promoting so far. That's already a criterial question. So then what that would pose to me as an anthropologist is, well, okay, so what are the criteria of likeness here? What are the criteria of sameness? How do I, as it were, know that something is like or unlike? And uh, so within human communities, what does that entail? And... I don't know that there's an obvious answer to that right off the cuff, but the great thing about it, especially if you're interested in anthropology, is that that's, that's a thing you can check out. You can investigate that. You can go in and find out by talking with the people, with engaging with the people who, for whom that's a question for you, what likeness looks like. So... Um, I, I go back to something that Das said in another context where she's contrasting uh, a liberal notion of the human, uh, sort of the human of human rights, with uh, caste notions of human. And uh, don't, don't let me fool you into thinking that I, I have expertise when it comes to caste. Don't, I'm not trying to present myself that way. But the point that she makes is that with something like caste, you have built-in inequalities of, of a variety of sorts, but there's no radical inclusion and exclusion of who's, of who's human and who's not. Whereas with the liberal notion, it is a radical inclusion and exclusion. Either you're in or you're out. Either you're human or you're not. And so what I, what I hope this gets across is that if we're going to think about likeness, then it's important to, to have a clear sense of what the criteria are that we're employing when we talk about likeness. And so in the two scenarios, they're not going to be identical. To come back to the example I was using earlier about Thailand and Buddhism, there being different schools of thought in Buddhism, uh, the one that's prevalent in Buddhism uh, in, in Thailand, excuse me, is that individuals kind of get the lives that they deserve. So that if you are born into a poor life that involves a lot of suffering because you're, you're poor and you're powerless, then that is an indicator or an index of your bad karma from previous lives. And so there's no injustice in that, that, that you've got this bad life. That is a just existence. Equally, for people who are rich and powerful and therefore have comparatively more comfortable lives, that is what they deserve because of their previous uh, accretion of merit over uh, their incarnations before. And so what this builds in into a social setting in which um, uh, Buddhism of this variety is prevalent is that social inequality is just, that that is a just social system, uh, which is an alarming thing to hear if if you have a kind of um, generic human rightsy disposition where you want to say, well, no, everybody's equal. And the maintenance of inequality is, is unjust. Uh, 
so again, what, what do we find here? That there are particular criteria around yeah. likeness and likeness, equality and inequality. And we need to get a sense of what those criteria are if we're to engage in this, what I call the work of finding our feet with one another. Um, so then the, the related enabling thing that I find sort of implicit in the question is that we can find these things out, right? That we, we share enough with one another that these are the sorts of things that we can investigate. And having arrived at a, a kind of understanding about them, we can actually have conversations with them where once we have worked out agreement in criteria, then we can start to have agreements and disagreements in our opinions about things. And so to go back to the Buddhist case, that's when uh, other schools of Buddhism that actually promote the idea of radical equality of humans, not based on karma, it's just, it, it just has a different uh, sort of criterial basis for what a human being is, but it's still available within Buddhism so that, again, a conversation is possible there because there's agreement in criteria. So therefore, you can have the conversation about uh, differences in opinions, and that can be a conversation in which, to follow the metaphor, everyone still has found their feet with one another. Okay, anyway, so um, so, so again, I, I don't know if that's really an entirely satisfying answer to your question, but, uh, but, but I, find, I find it a really interestingly provocative question. So I, I hope that that at least gives you something useful to, to work with. Um, so having like done research for the like an emerging human rights field, and um, we also got like the land of living graves, which is like a Muslim human rights violation. What do you think the role of like anthropologists should be in like either covering human rights violations or then following with like sort of advocacy and activism in that? What do you think? Um, like personally, what like was your role in that? And then also like, do you think that the, the field in general should have a stand? Yeah. Okay. Good. So this is um, this is going to sound a lot like an answer that I gave before, uh, and and that is um, I I'm sort of allergic to programmatic answers around these things. So so I think that if there are anthropologists and and there are plenty who want to advocate for human rights and who want to. Uh, promote human rights as a way of protecting vulnerable individuals, then uh, that then they should do that. Uh, I, I, I can't see any barrier to them um, following their inclinations and their motivations on that score. On the other hand, if there are anthropologists, I, I think I would put my own work into this category, who... Um, are, uh, well, I'll just, I'll speak in the first person and that'll make it easier. So I wasn't persuaded when I went into the field to do my work that I necessarily knew what human rights were within the context in which I wanted to get a handle on them. Uh, and that's, that's what was interesting about the project to me is, is that it seemed easy for me to presume that I knew what they were and that I would just go and I would find this thing that I knew what it looked like. The interest in the project, though, is to set that presumption aside and uh, go and do the work of checking it out and finding out what, in fact, uh, human rights uh, were, what they looked like uh, within a particular uh, Particular is overstating it. With within um, a more or less specified setting, so the the setting being Thailand, 
um, but that that's a little bit too homogenizing because clearly there are differences in opinion about what human rights were. So then being able to go and see what human rights looked like as they emerged within a particular context and how that picture differed from the expectations that I would have otherwise taken with me to the field. So that was the descriptive work that I wanted to do. And that didn't really give me the confidence that I could go there and say what a human rights violation was and what wasn't a human rights violation. Uh, and, and I didn't see it as my role. The role that I felt that I had was to give an account of how Thai people, specific Thai people, so not Thai people in general, but specific Thai people, how they uh, formulated human rights, how they put them to work, what sorts of projects they were engaged in, why human rights mattered to them. And, um, and so what I, what I found with that was not really that I was strongly inclined to be an advocate, um, but that there were already advocates there. And so simply trying to give a clear description and a clear account of what they were up to felt like the project that was right for me to do. Uh, so once again, then I've, I've come back to the same sort of thing that um, the project that motivates you and that interests you is the project that you should do. And other people are going to be dissatisfied with that no matter what you choose. Uh, and I think it's important not to try and do other people's projects. Let them do their projects and, and you do yours. And the contribution you make will be uh, indeterminate because who knows where things are going to go in the future. Um, and and the, the great thing about that, though, is that there's no such thing as a final say on any topic. There's just a continuation of a conversation. So you can continue to engage in conversation with people who, who may have quite different views about what you ought to be doing. I feel like I brought everything to a standstill. like a fully formed question but I guess I'm wondering like you've talked a lot about like access and like the dynamic between anthropologists and then like the field um, and the people they're working with and alongside and I guess I'm wondering like you've also touched on like finding your feet in the field and also like the certain identities that you hold and that the anthropologist holds in general how that either grants access or like denies access and I'm wondering I guess like how do you reconcile like I guess like in a field and then like not I guess the example that you gave was like not being able to like speak about the like, existence of God because like that's not a belief that you hold so I guess I'm wondering like how does that prevent you from like being immersed in the field in a sense I don't know if that makes sense yeah let, well let, so let me give an answer and if it's uh if it speaks to your question, then, then I got it. And if it doesn't speak to your question, then um, we can take another run at it. So um, when, when I come to things like, um, say, differences in criteria over, uh, over God or differences in criteria over uh, the idea of a soul as I say in Buddhism, um, I don't feel as an anthropologist that I'm compelled to 
share those criteria in order to be able to understand them. So I can come to an understanding, grant, granted it's going to be an intellectual understanding rather than one that organizes my life, but I can come to an understanding of what the soul might look like in Buddhism. And I, and I can give a description of it, um, and I can report on how that has a place in the way that people live their lives as Buddhists. Uh, equally, I, I can give a description, to go back to the example of my niece, I can give a description and come to an understanding of what it is to have the, the understanding of God that she has. I can describe what that looks like. I can, um, uh, I can say what the criteria are because I can ask her about them. We can have a conversation that will allow me to come to an understanding of that. And so it's not necessary, I don't see, for me to adopt those criteria as my own in order to have an understanding of what they are and to understand how they function or how, how they participate in the constitution of someone's everyday life. So if my work as an anthropologist is primarily descriptive, then I think that's what I need in order to do that descriptive work. If, I'm, if I find myself in a position where I simply can't get my head around what the criteria are in a given situation, that I think, that's a problem for me. Then I don't know uh, how to describe what I'm, well, I don't even know if I would say what I'm seeing because I don't really even know what it is that I'm seeing then. Um, so again, there's, there's a, a line from Wittgenstein that um, the Vina Das also picks up. Um, where, and the line is, uh, when I hit bedrock, my spade is turned. And what I think Wittgenstein is getting at with that and what I think Vina Das picks up on with that, specifically within anthropology, is that when I run into these moments where... I discover that I, I just don't have a feel for what the criteria are in whatever whatever it is that I'm trying to get my head around. Um, and so I've hit bedrock. There's no further that I can dig. I have the option either of trying to break through the bedrock or to exercise patience and allow my spade to be turned. My spade being also a metaphor for my, my pen, right? So to, to uh, in that sense, stop writing or stop trying to have a say about what whatever this thing is. Trying to break through, I think, is, again, what it looks like not to be responsive to the field and not to be answerable to the field. It is the way that you try to bend the 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 field to your will and to your understanding of things and uh, adopting instead uh, a posture of patience and waiting to see if you can learn what the relevant criteria are from the people who um, who employ those criteria is just a different kind of posture and it, so it may, might be one that never works out. I mean, that's that's just a living possibility, I think, within anthropology, is that you, you may be left with things that you never get. But it's also a posture that allows you the possibility of uh, working your way toward that. So uh, by, by way of an example, I'll give you one quick story. Uh, again, it's not my story. It's a story that I'm borrowing from, from Das once again. So she was advising um, a PhD student who was doing work um, in, I don't know where in India. That, that's not the important part for the story. And she did not share the spirituality of the people she was studying. 
And so she had asked, um, she was re reporting this story to uh, Professor Das, and she said that she had asked the, uh, the guru who she was uh, working with and whose practices she was trying to understand. So how is it that I get to this kind of spiritual place that you're in? And apparently, as the story goes, he says, well, what's something that you really, really love? And sort of without hesitation, she said, oh, my cigarettes. He said, okay. So every night before you go to sleep, offer your cigarettes a, a gift of some kind. And so she thinks that this is a completely cockamamie thing to do, but she, she indulges it. And, she, and so every night she'll like put out a little candy or something for her cigarettes. And she does this for a period of time. And um, the thing that sort of threw her off is that one night she had the feeling that the cigarettes had accepted the gift. And so I would say, you know, that is what it looks like to reach bedrock, acknowledge that your spade is turned and to exercise patience. And what happens? She comes to a different kind of understanding through this. Now, I think the way that the story ends is that that was also the last night that she offered gifts to her cigarettes because it kind of freaked her out, this idea that her cigarettes were accepting gifts from her. So, okay, let me pause there. D does that get to your question at all or have I just talked about other things completely? Okay, good. I think I may know what you might say, but I would like to, I would like to hear you say it. Um, I think you might say that it goes back to the same question of the question of um, how do we know whether we are alike or other like, and your response is that we can't necessarily engage with that question. We, whatever, whatever the object is that you're trying to concept is that you're trying to proceed, look, where do you stand and where do I stand vis-a-vis this? And there's a way to go about um, you know, finding out what the criteria are. Where do we stand vis-a-vis -vis that thing, right? So something like election denial, is that a lie or is that a difference in criteria? What is the difference then between lie Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, my, I, I think my immediate response is that, um, things like election denial are as far as I can tell, uh, may, maybe there are, are some exceptions to this, but as far as I can tell, they're, they're simply done in bad faith. And so that the people who are engaged in it on the whole um, are lying because they know that there's no evidence to support what they're saying, but they stick with it because they perceive that there is some plausible advantage that they and who they call their side will get from maintaining it that it so that it does some political work for them and the reason then that I would say that that is not a difference in criteria is because in order to lie you have to know what the criteria are, right? Like dissimulation relies on knowing what the other's criteria are and then simulating those criteria in order to be deceptive. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of an example of something, something that I couldn't lie about because I don't have the, the criteria to do it. And of course, um, um, I don't have any ready to hand. Anyway, I'll see if I can come up with an example of what that would look like. Um, 
so so yeah i'd say you can say things that are simply mistaken that's not about um differences in criteria you can say things that are uh lies or that are deceptive those are not differences in criteria in fact they require a familiarity with criteria to pull off um, but then you can say things that are simply about differences in criteria so again i i'll, I'll come back to the same example because by now it should start to feel familiar um, to my mind um, god concepts fall within the realm of myth uh, and and that these are just um, prevalent throughout human communities and human history um, whereas for my niece um, there are god concepts that are myth but hers is not with respect to her god and so it's not that either one of us is lying in that case it's not that either one of us is dissimulating but that we don't share criteria does that do an adequate job of answering and then that brings me to my next question after which i swear i thought i knew the other one um what then where with, is belief here is playing a role whereas in the instance of criteria whereas belief or faith show up they are always the same thing a play is playing a role in the criteria in sharing of criteria whereas in um whereas in these other instances of a mistake or lack of knowledge or lying it's a matter of a certain kind of evidence that's being used or manipulated or misused or so that be yeah so so this is this is again this is an interesting question so then um if we are to accept that something like faith does not hinge on evidence that, that it doesn't require evidence in order to have a place in someone's life it can nonetheless be criterial, right? So that you can, you can ask for and you can give criteria around questions of faith. And so again, um, I think that if I were to go to my niece and say, um, so tell, tell me about God that she could do that. And um, it would be a different question for me to say, I want evidence of God. Give me evidence of God. That's not the same question. And in part, that would be because there is a, a criterial difference between the, the two questions. Uh, and, and one, I'm like, I, I think actually in that case, if I were to say, give me evidence of God, like there's no way that I could ask that question of her without it simultaneously being uh, a, an aggressive question. Whereas I could ask her for her description of God, which is just one eliciting criteria. And that, that can that can be. A genuine inquiry that's that's not um, oppositional in nature. So then, on on the other questions, though, um, lies do depend on a notion of evidence and facts because they try to um, they try to play it as if there's evidence and facts. Right, that uh, that's what a lie depends on, uh, and and so if it is uh, something like say trying to express say say that I'm trying to pretend that I'm in pain, right? I'm lying about being in pain. I'm not actually in pain, but I'm trying to fool someone into believing that I am. 
I do that on the basis of my familiarity with what the expression of pain looks like. And so in one way, that's a criterial question. I, I have to be familiar with the expression of pain and, and what criteria apply to the expression of pain. But on the other hand, I have to, th there have to be some facts of what pain looks like, what people do when they're in pain. And so that there is a kind of a, a notion of truth and my lying has a parasitic relation to that truth, but there has to be some kind of truth in place for me to be able to simulate that truth in promoting my lie. Um, does that, does that do it? So can, can I ask a question of all of you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure for a second there. So what, um, I guess I have a, a two, two part question then. The first part is what, what do you find most promising or invigorating about anthropology? And the second part is, what do you find most confounding? Yeah. Um, I, uh, also being enrolled in a class on Wittgenstein right now, um, I think I find a lot of hope in the general rejection of generality um, and of essentialism that comes with anthropology. Um, I think there are a lot of disciplines that seek the uh, answer to things. Um, anth anthropology, I'm not an anthropology major at all. I'm just experimenting in this class. Like, that's something that I found. That I found and yeah. and yeah. That's something that I found to be very nice. Nice. Good. Yeah. You could add that they have all just done or are in the process of doing or they have all just done an assignment where they had to interview an anthropologist and kind of write up a profile of them on the basis of that interview and some basic familiarity with their work um, with the aim of eventually in their final essay writing a very similar response to the question that you have just asked. What, what, what animates you about anthropology? Um, and so they were supposed to sort of one of the things they were supposed to ask of their anthropologist was, what keeps you? What keeps you being an anthropologist? Why are you still an anthropologist? Right, you know, despite it all. Yeah, that's a great question. Or just to say that you have recently done an assignment and you should have had a chance to think about it. <laughs> and what invigorates you about Yeah, this is something I discussed in my interview, actually. Um, but. The idea of collaboration, I think, is something really cool that a lot of anthropologists do really well. And um, it will work with communities and kind of co-produce research is innovative in a lot of ways often and kind of disrupts like typical hierarchies of who produces research and knowledge in the academy. So we got something anthropology is really good at often, um, modern anthropology. So I think that's interesting to study. Kind of similarly for me, I really 
enjoy the fact that um, anthropology of it of it one universal truth or, and like embraces this idea of like differences within communities because I feel like a lot of other um, fields of study try and have like one objective truth or try and find like one objective meaning out of their like research and I really enjoy the fact that anthropology um, acknowledges that like research is subjective and is highly influenced by not only the person doing it but also the communities they're studying. Um, along with what Lynch just said, I really like the aspect of like collaboration because I feel like um, a lot of the time and with anthropology itself, like in the past, if you aren't actually like working with the communities and you're just trying to learn about them, it becomes very quickly like um, extractive and exploitative. So I like that like in modern anthropology and right now there's more of an in emphasis on like learning with the communities you're working with instead of just learning about them. Right, right. Can I just take a, a quick moment to, um, I, I'm, off, I'm not offering this as like a corrective, but it's kind of an invitation. It's, not, it's something I've been thinking about. So um, uh, maybe it's just my own little obsession. Um, and that's around the, the idea of objective versus subjective. So the, th the thing that I want to um, in, invite you to um, consider, and maybe, maybe reject, is that there are different ways of thinking about objective. So that the, the, the one that I think is prevalent and that I think that that response is pushing back against, which I appreciate, is the, the notion of sort of a truth that comes out of nowhere, right? That, that just exists, it's universal for, for all times and places. But there's another notion, so I've been thinking of this in particular with respect to ethics. Right. And there, there's a, a debate about whether ethics are objective and subjective. And the, as far as I can tell, the, the, the predominant ways of thinking about these are to think about ethics as subjective, meaning that they are entirely the product of the individual subject, unencumbered by anything else. Um, you might get there through someone like Kant, right? When Kant thinks of the individual reflecting through rationality on what one should or should not do and whether you can will that to be universal. The other is objective in the sense that ethics are timeless. They are the same for all people in all places. And so that's the other pull. The notion of objective that I am trying to entertain and that that I'm so, so that I'm inviting you to think about is one kind of let's say modeled on language, where language has, um, say when it exists as speech or as as writing, can be the product of an individual, but it's only by virtue of the fact that we are within a language, a, a speech community that we can make our individual statements. So the language has a kind of objectivity to it in that it's not simply the product of a single subject, right? The, the, to go back to, to Wittgenstein, um, you can't have a private language, right? Language always has to be shared. And so in that way, it has a kind of uh, objectivity to it in that it is not simply the product of just an isolated subject, an isolated individual. But on the other hand, of course, we know that languages change. They're not timeless. Not everybody speaks a single language. So anyway, I'm just wondering what, what you think about that. If there's, if there's a way of thinking about things as being objective, which could be a description of what it is to participate in social life that doesn't require that objective mean universal and timeless. Does that, does that track for you or does that just sound like nonsense? Um, I think it's 
If it doesn't track for them, Don, I will give them Ds. <laughs> okay, so I'm covering, actually, I'm recovering ground. Because um, that, that's an interesting kind of conception of objectivity. I'm curious, like, how does, because as you were describing it, it sounded a lot like the concept of, like, inserse subjectivity. So how would you differentiate this um, conception of objectivity with inserse subjectivity? Well, I, I would say that it is intersubjective, right? But, but again, with the proviso that intersubjective here doesn't mean that you start with two subjects that are pre-constituted who come into contact with one another, but rather their intersubjectivity co-constitutes one another. So that, again, um, if, if I and... Uh, Professor Ibrahim are talking about something, then it's not that I come as a fully formed subject, she comes as a fully formed subject, and then we have our intersubjective moment. Rather, it's that we co-constitute one another, as well as all of the broader um, the broader range of sociality in which we participate that also participate that, that also helps create us as subjects so that in that if that's the notion of, of subjectivity that is available which is the one clearly that I'm trying to hang on to then the notion of objective and intersubjective are not identical concepts but they're implicated in one another does that, does that respond to your question? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else wants to respond? Did you see the connection? Was it tracked with you? Um, did, did you can't see the connection. That's such... No. Okay. There's two ways we can approach this. And both of them I have brought up in class before. First way is to think about this, and Don, you will remember this, from, uh, or maybe you won't, it was a gazillion years ago, but Donna Haraway's Situated Knowledges article, where she's doing a critique of the, well, she's doing a critique of sort of the, of science, right, of, of science and reason and objectivity as that Kantian notion of, I actually don't even know if it's a Kantian notion, but it is that enlightenment notion, therefore Kantian notion, that you have this sort of claim that is made, a claim from nowhere, the truth from nowhere, where it is a disembodied, un, disembodied voice, disembodied gaze is creating a field of study, and then everything in that field of study just reveals itself to the scientist, to the active scientist who is doing the work. And typically, that active scientist in the past has always been a white man, right? On the other hand, a dip, and that has been, you have been told that that is objective, but we know it is not objective because we know it's not the gaze from nowhere, because that gaze is located in a specific place, it's located in a particular geography, it's located in a set of politics. We, and we know that now, right? So how does one approach this? The way to approach it might be, as Donna Haraway suggests, that instead of thinking of it as one eye and the gaze that that one eye allows to create a certain kind of field, instead think of it as a set of fractals. Right? You think of it as a field where every time you cut a certain, a, a, your different perspectives or your multiple perspectives are giving you a different look, a different way of seeing, a different position from where you are seeing, and every time you move, when you are in a different body, you're seeing differently, you're seeing through a different perspective, you will see more of the whole, but you will never see the whole. The whole can, you will never actually have access to the whole, but the more angles you have on it, the more nuance or the more richness you might be able to bring to whatever it is that you're trying to talk about, right? That's one way of thinking about it. And I don't have to up on the board in this sort of like, you know, bird's eye, what is it called? The God's eye perspective versus the worm's eye perspective or whatever. There are various different ways of thinking about this, right? The other way, and the way that 
uh, Professor Selby is asking us to think about this is when you think about something like language. Language is not yours. You're born into a language that you. This is also an example I have used in class or a theme that we've discussed in class. You are all born into certain languages, one or more. You don't come into this world knowing those languages. You learn those languages. You are learned. You learn how to use those languages to be able to make yourself understood within a community of speakers of those languages. But you are also using these words to say things that is meaningful to you. I don't know if that, I mean, are you, what was the example that I used was the example of I love you. I love you is one of the most formulaic things in the English language. And yet, those of you who speak English as a language and who might romance someone else who speaks the English language might well use the words I love you. And at that moment, you will be saying something that is meaningful to you. Right? So there, I think what Professor Selby is asking us to sort of think about is the language is in itself an objective truth, right? It exists before us, and yet we make it our own in some way. Right? We part, all of us are using that language, but all, for all of us, it allows a different way to move through that language. So then it gives us a different model of something like objectivity than, say, you know, this is, you know, starting from Plato onwards, that this is some kind of ideal, and then everything else is, you know, shadow of that idea, or whatever, like a copy of that ideal, or that this, this is something that holds true for now and for all time. Or if it holds true for now, it holds true for everybody now, right? It kind of moves us away from that singularity of, of thinking about truth and to a more, like, multidimensional perspective. Yeah, that that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> <F. laughs> All right. Um, we have five minutes left. I'm going to take that five minutes to thank you, Don, so very much for joining us. It has always been a pleasure to talk and to follow you with you. And this was no different, certainly for me. I hope it was for everybody else who was doing as well. Um, if there are any final comments that anyone would like to make, please take the opportunity now to do so. Well, let me then thank you for letting me into your classroom. This was a complete delight, and um, I, I really appreciate the seriousness of the questions and the engagement that you that you all brought to this. So, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.